right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, hello. Um, I am Liz Hermansky with the Crawford team at VIP Mortgage, and we are so excited to talk to you guys about this today. Um, renters are a huge segment in our market right now that a lot of agents aren't going after, and there are a ton of people that are still renting. So we're going to give you some strategies today on how to convert renters into buyers, um, and then some information on the most common down payment assistance programs as well. So I want to introduce Stuart Crawford. Um, he is the Crawford of the Crawford team. He's built his business over the last 15 years and was one of the original um, people at VIP Mortgage. So he's going to start, and Christy Shriver on our team is going to come up at the end and talk about some other program info as well. So enjoy. All right, thanks, yeah. Liz. How you guys doing? Doing perfect. Good. good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my absolute best to give you guys good information today on this. I, I, sometimes when you see this topic, it seems like a stale topic, like you've seen it before. If you go Google tips on how to do things, turning renters into buyers is something that uh, when I think about that, I think about, oh boy, this is going to be a, a class that's just going to be all the same old stuff that you hear all the time. Go farming for apartment complexes and all these things. I'm going to try to not talk about any of that and do this a little bit differently and get more into the kind of the psychology of selling people and getting people to trust you. but but focusing on the renting population, but I like topics where you can use the information and the education between all sorts of different lead sources, right? So it doesn't matter if it's a renter or someone that already owns a home. We can hopefully use this information for anyway. So hopefully you guys you learned something on that. And if you guys have questions or at any point, stop me if something doesn't make sense. <clears throat> Anyone who does know me knows I'm big on systems. And I'm a big believer that you should have a system for your business from start to finish, from A to Z. We can do a whole nother class on the client journey as far as how I think everyone should actually take the time and think about what does it look like from the second I get a lead from a client or engage somebody, right? All the way through my transaction closing and post-closing and have that all written out and have a plan because if it's, if it's built in a sense like a factory so you have your own expectations to operate with and how you should talk to every person the same, it, you'll actually see how much more efficient you'll be and your reputation starts building with that because everyone has the same experience with you. And I think that's one of the, the failures that I see with people is they'll deal with five different clients and two clients have one experience, three clients have a different experience and it's because they're not operating with a system mindset. I'm not gonna get into the, you know, the reason I said the big misconception with systems is if I stand up here and say systems, I'm thinking that you're thinking, well, what I just said. I need to have an actual factory-based process for how I do everything. You're thinking transactional, right? You're thinking I get a contract, I do this, I do this, I pull these levers, I push these buttons, and that's how my process goes. The reason I say that's a big misconception is you have to think about systems as how your mindset is. Like, how do you engage and communicate with people? You should have a, a way that you do that and be systematized about that to an extent. Not necessarily something you have to write down and have a plan for, but something to the standpoint where you've got somewhat of an agenda to communicate and to understand the person that you're trying to engage. In this scenario, it's a renter, right? So it's kind of how do we understand them and what it is that they want? Because I can tell you, if you're sitting down with a potential client and you're doing all the talking, I know for me personally, that's a huge turnoff, right? It's like I want to be asked a lot of questions. I want to feel like they want to know what, what it is that, that I'm feeling and what yeah. it is that I want to do, right? And um, just a quick example that we threw in here. <clears throat> By no means do I expect you to read this, or am I going to go through it? But this is this is one of our systems that we wrote out. So this is our this is our client journey, which is from the time we get a lead from you to how we cultivate it. We have it split up into the upfront sales side, which is pretty much this first part right here, and then it goes to part two, which is the transaction side, right? Because no matter whether you're a realtor or a lender, you're living in both these worlds. You're living from mm -hmm. point A in the first phase of upfront sales, which is as soon as you get a lead, how do you talk to that person? How do you cultivate that person? How do you follow up with that person? And that's its own monster of a job in itself, right? Yeah. And then once you get them to a contract, then you're in part two, which is the transaction that has its own easier usual system to follow because it's it, just the contract in itself is a system, right? You have an inspection period, you have an appraisal, you have these things that's just easier to follow. This up here though, most people that we talk to, sit with, coach with, don't have anything written out for this. And this is the most important piece. This is how you're actually cultivating these people. 
Because I see it in our business, I see it with our realtor partners. You spend all this time bringing in leads and trying to form relationships, but if you don't do it the right way and stay on top of these people, they're gone, yeah. right? No matter how much they liked you. And that's, that's at least our mindset on our team that we talk about, which is even if they had a great phone call with Christy and Christy knows that they loved her and she was amazing on the phone and spent an hour talking about DPA programs with them, if we don't follow up with that client, in my mind, they're gone because they might switch to realtors, that realtor sends them to another lender, they meet somebody else, they just add a side out of mind, right? Like those basics hold so true. So I, I just wanna show you this because this is something that we sat down and took the time to write out and it looks like a lot, but once you get used to doing it, I mean, we don't even look at this anymore. Everybody knows exactly what their job is and what they're supposed to do. And some of the um, rebuttals I'll get on this is, well, this is just for a big team. This is, you gotta, this is way too much if I'm a one-person show or a two-person show, and that, that's not true at all. When I first wrote this out, it was just myself and an assistant, and we split it up. This is my job, this is your job. As we grew, we just assigned these numbers to those team members, so it's scalable too. And even if you're a one-person operation, you should still be doing this for yourself, right, to, to some extent. So I just thought I'd show you guys that, and it's just kind of an example of what we did. Um, in, in terms of if you're talking to a renter, and again, it doesn't even have to be about renter, it's just engaging people in general, is you have to start with the diagnosis. On our end, on the lending side, our loan application is the discovery call. So that's where Christy, for example, gets on the phone with your client, asks a lot of questions, that's why we call it the discovery call. There's a lot of words in the mortgage business that I don't like, they sound very uh, unprofessional, just the word, the loan application to me just does not sound like a fun process anybody wants to go through, no. right? it just doesn't sound. So we change the verbiage that's part of our system as we make them feel better by changing what we call certain steps. What do you call it? What do I call what? The loan application then. Discovery call. The discovery, that's okay. what it's okay. called, yeah. So, discovery call. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're big it. proponents of trying to get people on the phone and like have that first date over the phone, right? Ask a bunch of questions. And so that's why I say here, you can never ask enough questions because even though I said they should be doing most of the talking, well, you got to engage them to ask those questions. If you're just sitting there selling yourself the whole time, which I see this all the time, you just have to think about how you want to be sold to. I know if I go anywhere and I'm buying any sort of product, if the salesperson is just talk, 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 I'm immediately turned off. And maybe that's just my personality, everybody's different. Um, but I feel like just a few things we're gonna talk on this site can set you apart in a, in a, in a big way. Um, so it's understanding what do we know about our potential client in this scenario, why are they renting, what are their goals, and have they ever taken the time to assess their options, why or why not. Most renters, for the most part, are probably going to be first-time home buyers, so they already have no education or understanding of what their options are, what this process looks like. So they are going to lean on you and us for you to hold their hand, be their guide, and be their teacher, right? And guess what? Like the famous saying that the president of VIP is always saying all the time, Jay's always saying, we don't know, we don't know, and we don't know a lot, right? That's exactly what these people, they have no idea what they don't know. They read something in the paper, their friend told them something that probably isn't even true, right? So we also have to validate information and know what we're talking about. And where I see a lot of failure at this, again, in lending and realtor side, is you start engaging someone, maybe you're in an open house, and your conversation comes up, oh, I rent, Lee, okay, well, um, have you thought about buying? Yeah, I don't know, maybe thought about it, I'm just walking through the neighborhood. And like the question and answering just stops too quickly, and they don't know what else <laughs> to ask, right? It's like, what else do you ask them? Uh, what's your price point? Well, I don't know. I never bought a house before. Okay. Why are you renting? Right? Maybe that's too personal a question, but I don't think so. It's, hey, I'm trying to understand who you are and what you are trying to get in the future. And you got to make them understand that you don't care about a sale tomorrow. That, to me, that's a big deal. Yeah. You just care about building a relationship today. Right? And so if anyone senses that you're trying to go get a transaction tomorrow and get a commission, as much as I hate saying that out loud because it sounds so bad, but there's people out there that are like that, right? We all know that. That's gonna turn someone off immediately. So it's like, and, and I, I'm a big proponent too, and be upfront and say those things to somebody. Be full disclosure, hey, I wanna start a relationship with you. I just wanna ask you some questions. You don't have to tell me everything, but it'd just be great if I get to know you a little bit better. Tell me about yourself, why are you doing this? Why have you not thought about this? Is there something out there in the market that's telling you that maybe you shouldn't go buy a house? Ask a bunch of questions, and if you're sincere and authentic in that Q&A, 
there's very few people that aren't going to engage with you and not at least like you. And again, one of your goals should always be, how am I different than the next person they're going to talk to? Because they are going to talk to somebody else. The big assumption that I've always had is, if we operate from a professional mindset that no matter what, we assume that every client we talk to is going to talk to another lender, we're going to be better every day because we're, that's like how we lose sleep at night, right? It's, I just had a great conversation with you and I don't want to lose this relationship, so how can I be better in that phone call? And it gets to a point where it becomes a game with us, which is we hope in some cases they've talked to another couple lenders before they talk to us. Because when they talk to us, we spend so much time, we consult them, we educate them, we ask a ton of questions, and we are putting ourselves up here compared to most lenders, just like you can put yourself up here as a realtor compared to most realtors, by being different in that way. And it's really an easy way to do it. Um, and it just comes with high care factor, right? You just care about these people and you're trying to do, do what's, what's right by them. Um, that being said, so you're trying to figure out, I put diagnosis because we always like analogies and it's like the doctor office analogy, right? We're trying to diagnose with this renter, why are you renting, what's going on, what's holding you back? Most likely they don't have any information, they don't even know where to start making a decision. And this one I see all the time is most people don't even understand the market, not just the person you're talking to, but as the realtor you don't understand the market. As the lender we don't understand the market. And if you're a true professional and you care about your craft and you want to be good at what you do, you have to know what you're talking about, right? That doesn't mean you have to be up on every single thing every single day. This industry moves so fast. If you were to call me five times in a week and ask me five different questions about a certain loan program, there's a chance that half of those times I would tell you, you know what, that may have just changed, let me double check, we'll call you right back. Because we just don't want to mislead anybody with information because it's always it's changing so much and, and evolving. And it's important that we figure out what it is that they have in their head with the market so we can figure out how to actually tell them what to do, right? Because if you're a doctor and you're gonna diagnose somebody and say, hey, here's the problem with your heart, but you have to actually have an action item after it, right? Yeah. Here's a problem with your heart. I need you to go to the surgeon and have these three things done to you. That's what we should be doing as professionals and as realtors, figure out how do they perceive the market? What are they seeing? What do they think the challenges are? And, and what are they hearing out there? Ask those questions. I promise you, just asking those questions, 99% of realtors aren't even asking that. How many people in this room have asked that question before? How do you perceive the market? What do you think about the market? point in case, right? No one's asking that question. Yeah. So you're automatically different. Well, I don't want to ask them that question. I don't want anyone to tell me, hey, it's a seller's market. Like, I don't want them to say that. But I mean, I should welcome that question so that I can combat it with... Exactly. A great answer. A great answer. Yeah. That you great are answer. Ask, yeah. asking those questions, yeah. Asking those questions that's gives you an opportunity to showcase how much of a professional you are. That's how I look at it. So that's like someone asking us, hey, Stuart, what are rates going to do? <laughs> haven't heard that question, right? <laughs> so um, it, it's just, and it, it just makes me laugh. It's like, well, I don't have my crystal ball, but based on my experience, here's what I'm seeing in the market. Here's what we think might happen. Here's what speculation in the news tells us. But disclaimer, I really have no idea. I mean, that's always right. a joke, right? We don't, and we tell people that. Right. But that, that gives me an opportunity to showcase my professional skills and how I communicate and how I deal with, call it a little bit of adversity. And... Hopefully, they're going to see that and they're going to correlate that with how you're going to operate in an actual transaction when they're going to need you, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a, a little bit not sane. I mean, when being a lender, I think in general, you have to be a little bit crazy. But I, I actually welcome the damage control conversations because I see them as this opportunity to show who we really are. Anybody can sit there and say, here's our great rate, here's our great program, I'm going to close you in seven days, I'm going to do this, that, and this. But things happen, right? Yeah. How many real estate transactions go super, super smooth? Right? Not very many. So when they do happen, that's actually, instead of whining about it, <clears throat> I hate whining, I see it as it's an opportunity. Get on the phone, tackle it head on, put the pilot flame out before it gets any bigger and show them what you're made of. And then they're going to know, you've got my back, you're a professional, you know what you're doing. And I trust you. I know that you got my back through this thing. So, and then hopefully, like in our, in our world, I welcome that because I want that client to call you and say, hey, man, the way these guys handled this was so great. I feel so much better now. And now you're going, okay, this is a good partner that I should, I should work with, right? So for us, there's, 
we want them telling you that, right? Just like right. you want them telling their friends how you handled it, right? It's all basic stuff. There's nothing that's rocket science here, but sometimes you just have to hear it over and over again and then figure out how you're gonna incorporate it into your world, right? Um, back to this. So what's out there influencing their thoughts and eventually making decisions for them? Because at the end of the day, the consumer, most of the time, isn't even making their own decision, I don't think. They're basing it off all the stuff out there, the white noise, the Facebook, the whatever, and they make a decision based on all that unvalidated information on what they're going to do with their life next. Everybody's guilty of it. I probably am at some point. Everybody, right? So if you actually ask somebody this, hey, is there something out there? So if we role played that, right, and you said, well, I don't want to ask that question. Well, how do you perceive the market? Well, I heard it's a seller's market, and it's not a good time to buy. Yeah. I don't want to buy when it's high. You go, well, of course you don't. Nobody does. Well, what makes you think that? Tell me what's your why. Where did you get that information? Did you read that somewhere? Did a friend tell you? You just assume that because you... That could be the case. You start asking and digging deeper, they're all of a sudden going, wow, this guy's really engaging me and asking questions. And it just starts, because all you're trying to do is build trust, right? You're building a relationship, that's it. And I, what I wanted to do is, and I'll give you guys some stats on the next slide, but like this just gives you an idea of what's been posted out there recently. And everything's contradictory, right? I mean, you've got Phoenix housing market overvalued, don't expect a bubble how we're faring over the next 10 years, 10 years after housing crisis, a realtor, a renter starting over, home prices rising faster than ever, median home price appreciation decelerates, home prices rising faster, median home price appreciation decelerates. Okay, you with me? It's a complete contradiction. An argument against the housing market correction in the next 24 months, we're probably at peak housing. Here's what that means. I mean, as a consumer, you read that yeah. at peak housing, you're like, I'm out. I'm out. Why would I yeah. buy if my stockbroker told me, hey, this is the highest the stock's ever been, and I don't know if it's going to go any higher, but you should buy it now. Right. Sell it when it drops. Makes no sense, right? So that's what the consumer catches on. So you got to help walk them through it. And I want to be clear, guys. I'm not saying convince people of something that's not reality. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying be the expert that helps them sift through this. And you can even say, you know what? I'm reading the same conflicting information, and it is hard to decipher. I don't know what the reality of the market is. Does anybody really? There's just analysis and economists out there that tell us Predict. what they think. And yeah. we have to make our best informed decision. But we're working through it together, right? And I'm going to guide you through it, and I'll try to help you dispel anything or validate anything. Um, people haven't been this optimistic about home prices since just before the crash. So... <laughs> Here's some real stats that I thought would be helpful to, to show you guys. I bet you most people in this room don't know any of this, nor do most people around town. I didn't even know a lot of this until I started digging as far as the, the, the specifics, but two separate studies are recently done suggesting that many are better off renting than buying a home. Now you're talking to the renter, and he read one of those studies that was posted somewhere on CNN or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You're all automatically in a tough sales situation on how to convince them that it is a good time to buy, right? So that's already what you're up against. And we'll send these, we'll send these out, right, Liz, so they have all these Absolutely, stuff? Absolutely, okay. yeah. So um, as long as you're on the sign-in sheet, we'll send out all the slides to you so that you have them along with some other stuff, too. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's coming around somewhere, so keep passing it if you have it. Is this what we're supposed oh, to Oh, yes, might be. So, yeah, sorry. Christy, you gotta keep passing it. Yeah. Can't let it sit on the side. Puff, puff, pass, yeah. Christy. <laughs> um, okay, analysis by Realtor.com shows that monthly costs have risen 14% in the past year compared to increase in rent of just 4%, meaning cost of owning a home has risen 14%. And rent has risen just 4%. That's good information to know, right? If you're talking to someone who's a renter that potentially you're trying to make them understand the market and where they're at. I bolded this one for a reason. 41% of the population lives in a U.S. county where a median household income can afford a medium-priced home. Okay, so think about that. The majority of the country is somewhere where the medium income cannot get you the medium home. The reason I bolded it is because not only is it important, but Maricopa County is in the 41%. That's good news. Just If you just walked through the last slide on these three with someone that was talking about, I don't know what to do about renting, is it not a good time, is it seller's market, it's too high, I feel like if someone sat down and explained that to me, and then as we continue, at the very least as a consumer, I would say, you know what, that guy knows what he's talking about. I like that guy. Right? I may not do anything. But that's what you want. You just want them to be like, this is, I trust this guy. So if we're walking through open houses, 
So I remember the big assumption, they're talking to other people, so you gotta be better than the next person, right? Doesn't mean you have to be the best, you just have to be the one they trust the most and they, they feel good about. It's all about making people feel good. I mean, that's, at the end of the day, that's all it is. Um, then you go into, in July, the median monthly cost of owning was $16.47 a month, average cost of rent was $12.67. Just to be clear, these are national. national. This yeah. isn't here, okay? We'll get into Maricopa. Um, Wouldn't, so that, yeah. Sorry. So Wouldn't that look better to a renter? Like, yeah, I, I knew it. I should rent. But hold on. That's national. Wait until you see the local Okay. Yeah. But short answer, yeah. Top of right? the, you read that, you go, I should just yeah. rent. But okay. we haven't talked about what are the real value of home ownership other than just it makes you feel good to own a home and have something that's yours that you're paying off over time, right? Forced savings plan. Remember, yeah. fully amortizing loan, you're paying down principal every month. I realize you don't pay a lot of that down until years later, but... For a lot of people, they buy one home and they stay there for a long, long time. So it's a forced savings plan. You're building equity in something, okay? And they, everything's based off assumptions. That's assuming that market values don't go down and that they maybe go up or, you know, who? no one ever knows about that. Um, Wouldn't well, that number be closer to because you're gonna have a big tax saving off that 16.4? Exactly. Also. So by the time you figure your tax bracket, you're probably pretty close to 12. 16. Exactly. I mean, there's a list, I mean, I can think of a list of 10 things probably fairly quickly where you would say, here's why, Mr. Consumer, this isn't, this isn't what it seems, right? Here's the other advantages over here. Um, let alone the fact of, I was a renter at one point. I remember having to move out of a place I didn't want to move out of. The landlord wanted to sell it, he was done, and now I'm at the mercy of someone else's decision, which I couldn't stand. So there's that. That doesn't even have a monetary value to it, right? That's just a life thing. I just want to yeah. make my own decisions, do my little thing here, don't bug me. Um, Last time the majority of people rented was 1999. Since 2010, ownership has been in favor. So this has been a market since 2010 nationally where more people have been owning homes and you've heard a lot of talk about it. And I think that's gonna to continue to happen personally. And then we get into Maricopa County. I said good news because like I said, we're in that 41%. And I'm gonna give you guys a real life example too that I think when you take this home, if you are talking to people, it'll really help you. So the median income in Maricopa is 55,000 a year. Excuse me. Now, with no other debt, they can qualify for a $2,000 mortgage payment. If you guys wanna know easy math on how a lender does a debt to income ratio and qualifies somebody, to make it easy, it's 50%. Whatever your gross monthly income is, half of that is how much can go out to whatever your monthly debts are currently, plus your new proposed mortgage payment, okay? Key thing to remember when I say current debts, only on a credit report. Not your cell phone bill, not your car insurance, not your gas, your groceries, right? Just what's on a credit report, which is revolving consumer credit cards, student loans, any car loans, right? Major debts that would be on a credit report. So for someone making 55,000 a year and they don't have any of those type of debts, they can take on a $2,000 mortgage payment and I'll walk you guys through what kind of a house price it is. You wanna guess anybody? What mm -hmm. purchase price it is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it would be like 290. You should have a prize or something. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of 400. I'll give you this click. <laughs> 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 well, Brian, you want it. Depends on the land. Depends on the loan size, well, but it's about 300. So you're pretty close. It's, it's that PITI. Yeah, yeah PITI. And I'm going to give you guys an example so you can see it. Yeah. And there's a lot of variables there, too. Did, how, did you put enough money down to avoid mortgage insurance, right? That affects the problem. Well, it's the rate, you know, because... It's the rate. <laughs> see, you should be a lender. <laughs> Well, a lot of what ifs. Uh, medium home value in Maricopa, 262.9. We all know that's going up. I mean, I can tell you guys the one of the hardest things, and Jim, I mean, Jim knows this, who works with us. Um, when we qualify somebody now in like the 2, 250 range, that conversation's a lot different than it was a year ago. I mean, when we tell somebody that, right, Christy, it's we're it's like you know they have limited options when they go out there and try to find a house. And you almost, when you call your realtor partner and say, hey, guess what? They're pre-qualified. How much? <coughs> Two of them. <laughs> you know, so because you know your realtors have a hard, like they have a hard job on their hands unless they're going to be way out, right? Yeah. It's like, and then for a lender, it's immediate condo is all we're thinking. That purchase price, lower purchase price, it might mean that it's going to be just condominiums is all they're going to find. And condos, as you guys know, if you've dealt with them, are another animal. If you don't understand why condos are another animal from a lending standpoint, and you've done one, then the lender you're working with 
didn't take the proactive phone call to explain it to you, and they should have, keep that in mind, okay? So if you're ever dealing with a condo, find the lender partner you trust, ask the question, say, hey, we're looking at condos, tell me what I need to be aware of, because, I mean, we could do an entire class on that. Maybe yeah. that's, that's actually a great idea. Yes. Okay. Your class. What's that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're doing a class we'll on condos. Maybe next month. Okay. So, but that would be a really good one because you guys, I mean, it's there's a lot that goes into it on our end. Um, so, mobile homes. What's that? Mobile homes. Mobile homes. Mobile homes. Yeah, we can lend on those. No, but class on that. Oh, too. class like on that. Talking about. Maybe Christy knows things. all about them inside and out. That's a whole other, that's like five classes. Yeah. First we'd say, okay, do you want to do mobile homes, yes or no? And see who checks this box. <laughs> we'd, have a, we'd have a small class. Um, so, but anyway, point being, I've noticed, I've been doing this a long time, guys. I've noticed that recently, wow, when you pre approve someone for 2250 I mean, it's like we we hope they find a contract out there somewhere and even if they do they're getting beat up I mean, we have someone that we work with who's trying to buy her first house right now yeah. and and she's experiencing all the things that our clients are actually experiencing so you know to make light of it for her i tell her i say hey now you know what all of our clients deal with like this is real stressful stuff when you're out there trying to find a house and getting beat up on every i mean making full price offers and losing them yeah right that's yeah. tough <laughs> and and what that does if you start asking the person why are you still renting that might have been the case we probably have more clients than we ever have that have been looking, canceling, looking, canceling, and just go, you know what, I'm yeah. done. I'm not gonna look for a house anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean that never used to happen. Yeah. So yeah. that stuff's changing. Um, but make sure if they do that, you have a system to follow up with them and stay in front of them, right? Because eventually they'll buy. Um, average rent for an apartment in Maricopa is 1315. Now this takes an analysis of like all the bedroom counts. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's up almost 10% from last year. So now, to your renter person who says, well, I don't think it's a good time, you'd go, you know, it's interesting you say that because I, I, I know that rents have gone up 10% in the last year. Yes, home values are going up and prices are going up, but your rent, if it keeps going up 10%, do that math real quick on a calculator, then figure out that mortgage payment, right? right. I mean, supply and demand, simple economics, right? If more people say, I'm not gonna buy, it's a seller's market, I'm gonna wait this thing out, and we can talk about that for a whole 20 minutes. Then more people go into the rental pool, there's more demand over there, and rents go up, right? Very simple. Mm -hmm. So that, I feel like just this bullet point, you could, you could have that whole conversation on with someone who is hesitant to go buy. Again, I'm not saying convince people to buy homes that aren't comfortable buying homes. We're, you know, that's what we're here to help with. Maricopa County single family rent averages a dollar to a dollar twenty-five a square foot. So a two thousand square foot house to twenty-four hundred a month, right? So on that note, and they're so limited, pretty much all right. those just like homes now. I mean, you have to get them within first weekend on market yeah. to get, even get a good rental. Yeah. Yes, twenty-four hours. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy, and it's uh, it's even common now for multiple offer situations on those where it ends up going over lit, over a rent list price, which is crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. 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 And that's a great point. It's like to get into that, usually you need yeah. first months and security deposit, so it's forty five hundred bucks just yeah. to get into a rental. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Sometimes they're only paying like two percent. Yeah. Yeah. Two hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean, right now everything's getting more expensive. Yeah. Everything, your toilet paper, I mean, you name it, all the way up, it's getting more expensive. Uh, doesn't mean it's gonna stay like that. So here's the quick example. $300,000 purchase price, I went with the lowest down payment option available, right, unless you're doing like a VA loan, which is, but that doesn't include everybody. So I tried to make this real life, right? 3% down, they need $9,000. $1,500 mortgage payment, 200,000, or 200, excuse me, mortgage insurance, 200 property tax, 75 homeowners. So it's about 2,000 a month. So that goes back to the example we were talking about. So if we know that the median income is 55,000, they have no other consumer debt, they could qualify for about a $300,000 purchase price, but they need 9,000 in down payment, right? So um, the, the key thing, and we're gonna get into some down payment stuff, but this is, this is an important one. Do they have a choice? Meaning, do they even have a choice to buy a rent, right? They may not, yeah. but you have no way of knowing that unless you engage someone to help you with that. Insert favorite lender friend, right? And this is where hopefully you guys have some sort of a system 
to introduce your people to a lender that you trust, that you know can help educate and walk them through this process and consult them and ask the right questions, do a discovery call, do the diagnosis, and give them real options. Because the whole, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know a lot, that is unbelievably true for the people that we talk to. Whether they're first time home buyers, or whether they're the guy who's buying his 10th home and makes a million dollars a year, Everything in between, I've had a conversation with all those people that have had the same underlying uh, you know, similarity of they didn't have a clue what they were talking about, even if they thought they were, right? And then we came in and dispelled, we put the puzzle together for them, and then we can come back to you and say, here's exactly what they can do. So if you get someone who says, I can't qualify for a house, what I would be saying if I were you is, have you qualified for, have you talked to anybody? Well, no, I just know I can't because I don't make enough money and I got all this debt and I didn't got these collections. I mean, like I've heard all these conversations. I can't tell you how many people that we get that that's the situation. They start with that. Like some people just air the dirty laundry out right there, right? Like, hey, Stuart, just before we get into it, I just want to let you know, I got divorced three years ago, we got this thing with my dog, there's this, and they like go on this whole deal and they've given me every reason to not even want to work with them. Not that I feel that way, but that's like what they're doing. Like, don't even waste your time with me. 20 minutes in after some good questions, guess what? You can buy a house and here's what it looks like and it's not as expensive as you thought. And again, we are not here, nor should you be. I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but we're not here to sell people to do something that they don't want to do. We're here to educate them and make sure they understand their options and then they get to choose. I'm a big believer in you can only make a decision based on the information you have right now. And you can make the best decision you can make and then you gotta move on. Can't look back, right? They need us to give them information and educate them. And I find that if you in incorporate that into your conversation with people, hey, I just want to give you, because we do this a lot, right? With all the different loan options, it can be overwhelming. <coughs> and so what we'll say is, just so, to be clear, we're not here to tell you what to do or to steer you in any certain loan product. We're here to educate you on all the options available to you. We want to make sure you understand them because my goal is I want you to feel comfortable. That's it. I want you to feel good and I want you to feel comfortable. And the only way I can ensure you feel comfortable and feel good is if you understand this stuff, right? Everybody in here can tell a story about not being comfortable with something. It's because you didn't understand fully what was going on or you're trying to figure something out, right? It happens. So if they hear that from you, automatically I find this wall goes down and like all of a sudden like the relationship can start. They go, okay, yeah, oh, that makes me feel so much better. Okay. And then they're, they're willing to hear you out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you guys have questions on any of that? Okay. So the other thing we wanted to, to, to go over is, you know, when people think about how do I convert renters into buyers, what our main topic was supposed to be, I know I kind of went off a little bit on it, but hopefully it was, you guys found it useful, is <clears throat> I immediately think things like grant programs, right? You guys have heard about them. You've probably had multiple classes in this room, in the old room, about grant programs. What we don't want to do is bore you with all the details of every grant program available, but we can do all of them. Um, and we're very good at them. Christy on our team is an expert at the, at the down payment assistance programs. The, the big one right now is the pathway to purchase, the P2P. Have you guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's an awesome program. And keep in mind that there's very few realtors that I know that really want to know the ins and outs of, of every part of the loan program. Really? Just, it just happens. We'll start going into an education on it, and it's like, okay, just I'm just going to tell them to call you, and you walk them through <laughs> it, right? Because you're the expert in something else. Like You should spend your time trying to just cultivate these relationships and, 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 and selling houses. So I only say that to say we have all the detail here, and Christy will start going through some of these slides, but we'll then focus on the, the pathway to purchase because I think that's a great one to know about right now because a lot of people are reading about it. Um, and then we'll email all this stuff to you guys, and you can ask any questions you want. Sound good? Right. Now the brains of the operation shows up. One quick thing I want to say too is um, a recent study showed 78% of Americans still think you have to put 20% down to buy a home. No. So really? that is something you commonly have to get comfortable talking about at open houses with people is kind of debunk that right off the bat and start to have the conversation. So Stuart said, ask the questions because oftentimes so many people don't even think that they could purchase. But as soon as you give them the, the idea that they can, they want to. 
and they can do it. So you just really have to get comfortable talking about it. And um, as he said, you know, send them to somebody who's going to educate them. And what we find, I have a lot of clients that meet with us and ask, oh, well, do you guys do BPA programs? And it's like there's this weird stigma about it. Because I think a lot of lenders don't really want to do them, to be honest, because they're a lot of work and not a lot of money for the lender. And they're challenging oftentimes because it's generally people who don't have reserves and things like that. But what we do on our team is we know that the, we're going to give those people an amazing experience. They're going to refer a friend to us that's a renter. And guess what? In two years or three years or four years, when they move up, they're going to come back with us again. So Christy is going to talk about the great experience we give them and some info on the BPA programs now. Sure. Yeah. And to kind of piggyback what she said, um, most clients I do talk to that are first-time home buyers do think that you have to place down 20% to obtain a loan. I don't have any of this money, and in reality, when you let them know, hey, first-time home buyer, three percent conventional loan is the required minimum. It kind of shocks them. We get more to the conversation, the discovery call. They have family who can gift them down payment funds. Grandpa has, you know, X amount of dollars, and when you have a seller concession, maybe a small gift and three percent down, you know, it's extremely doable. So, um, you know, we walk it with the client also. Credit barriers, that's a huge thing. Clients think, oh my gosh, my score is so bad, you're not gonna believe this, and they're so afraid of their credit score, their credit history. FHA, 580 minimum, um, 620 <laughs> conventional. Yeah. You know, pending the credit history, the credit depth, the I mean, underwriting approval, but yeah, we can. There's lots of disclaimers yeah. in the mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of disclaimers. <laughs> but, but people, still, yeah, 580, that's yeah, And what our team after. is good exactly. at, we rescore, we have tools with the credit bureaus. We can rescore your clients. If they need a simple 10, 20, 30, 40 point boost, we walk them exactly through what they have to do. And it might be as simple as paying a few credit cards down. If you have a small collection, a small credit card erroneous late. The booster score is 60 points, and so they remove it, and they're boom, they're ready to go. So there's things that we can um, dispel and, and rake through and say, this is actually not so bad. We can get you, you know, into this financing, no problem. The the DPAs, for short, Dr. and Mrs. programs, um, 640 minimum FICO for all the programs. Um, the there's a healthy price point for these, um, about 370 to 390 price point, which is pretty great. Um, the income limits about 92 to 99 thousand, depending on the program. Um, there's a few caveats. Home buyer education class. Um, the rates are a little higher, um, five and a half to six and a quarter. But rates are kind of on that rise right now, so they're not too bad. And um, keep in mind, sorry, Christy, that we run the recovery and break even analysis for those clients. Meaning, we say, and I'm just making these numbers up, so bear with me. Conventional loan, three percent down, five percent rate. Down payment assistance, three percent down. Grant funds to cover the three percent down, six percent rate but we show them that by not having to write the check for the 3% down over here because the grant fund's giving it to you, the difference in payment is X, and the cash recovery period from that down payment, I'm just making this up, is 10 years down the road. If they say, well, I'm only gonna live there seven years, why would you put your own 3% down? Take the higher yeah. interest rate, take care of money, yeah. and use your 3% for something else, right? Right. Sorry, no, that's, that's, that's great. Um, it's a percentage of the loan amount, so, Oftentimes, if we can qualify your borrower on the 5% of their loan amount on a conventional DPA, that covers their full 3%, so their whole down payment's covered. It covers some of their closing costs. You get a small seller concession. Their client's coming in with, sometimes, nothing. They get their earnest deposit back at closing, and boom, they're in. So there's some great programs here, and there's a lot of caveats with a lot of these programs, so there's a lot of bullet points. We don't want to, you know, get into the meat of it, a lot of it's we can look at the client. Um, but here's kind of the 645 go, um, the interest rate on um, the Home Plus um, today's trading at six and a quarter, and they do not go off of the market rate. So these entities, they're not going off of the 10-year treasury note, the things you see in the news. So we, you know, make sure to say, you know, they post these rates on a daily basis. We check them, we can lock them in once you're in a contract at the posted rate. So they're, you know, they kind of fluctuate. And on that note, just good for you guys to know, no matter who they call lender-wise and if they're doing a grant program, it's the same rate. VIP mortgage doesn't set that rate. Mm -mm. Does that make sense? It's a grant administrator that has all these programs. And so if you have a client that says, well, I might shop around, you can just save them the time and say, unless you didn't like the conversation with Christy, okay, but if you enjoyed her, you're not gonna get a better rate somewhere with these programs. They're set by someone else. And you can't lock in these rates until 15 days prior to closing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until the other day when somebody's rate changed. And my lender didn't let, didn't let them know that that was a possibility, so. 
We well, well, we couldn't lock it in. You know, we met with them 30 days ago. We couldn't lock it in until 15 days before closing. Like, there's, a, there's some rules around when the funds have to be reserved and our process behind that. Um, it's really rare that the rate will change on someone in process. It does happen uh, in, a, in a highly volatile market. I haven't seen that hasn't happened on our end mm -hmm. since I can remember. Yeah. Like we <laughs> pre-approved 30 days ago, roughly 30 days ago, as we're closing on Friday, and 15 days ago, roughly, the rate went up like half a point. Maybe it was, maybe it was 0.25. Uh, but either way, they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa! When we sat down with you at the at the meeting, you said this was our rate. Like, we all looked at each other and agreed this is our rate, and now you're telling me the rate went up, and nobody said that it could have changed. And I was kind of sitting there like, yeah, you're right, on all those points. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like user error, definitely. Yeah. You have to set the expectation, right? It's all about setting the expectation. Like, but it, it is true, though, that you can't lock in a rate until 15 days before closing? I don't think that's the no, case at all. No. Of no. no, not at all. There are some odd caveats um, with the home and five. I was going to say with, it's home and five. That's I was just thinking about home and five when you home said that. If they've reserved funds with home and five, and that fell out, they have to wait a certain period of time to re-reserve funds with home and five. So it might be something okay. where they were, they didn't want to tell the client that, or they didn't know. Sometimes lenders don't know their programs, and they didn't know that, and they probably weren't able to lock in that rate. And they said, "Well, we'll float it out. We'll see. Well, hopefully, it doesn't change." Or they didn't know and it, it did, lock up. and then sure. they couldn't lock yeah. it until that point. That's probably if I had to guess what happened. We cool. have asked both questions the last time. Oh slide. yeah, so. <laughs> 99,000 for income is a lot of money, right? Yeah. So I think the, another misconception for DPA is that it's for poor people. Right. Or poverty, you know, people right. who can't yeah, afford right. a house. But it's like, you make 100 grand, you can afford a house. And but, to piggyback on that yeah. really quick, Liz, that income limit, we oftentimes do not have to use every single pay line. So if they do have, besides base pay, you know, commissions, overtime, some bonus, there are times we don't have to use those additional pay lines, which can, in essence, reduce right. that income and get them into this program. So sometimes if they're literally just over that limit, and we can... But they worked like a bunch of overtime lines, last year because of some incident that happened? There's some that it's we not don't normal. have to include. Like maybe the right. W-2 shows that they made more technically, but right. because the way their pay percentage lines out, <clears throat> excuse me, different sources of income, you don't have to use all those other sources. Sure. I mean, they're... And we bet people that. who wrote these rules, it's, it's amazing on all these programs. I mean, all the ins and outs, I mean, they don't make this easy. There's know? so much so. that goes into it, and we, you know, <coughs> we, we know these ins and outs, but so that's also nice to know that if there's a, um, a bar that has different pay lines, sometimes you don't have to include those in that income limit. That's huge. That's gotten so many people into this program that think that before couldn't have gotten into it. Yeah, and sorry. No, no, that's And keep in mind, guys, that with some of these grant programs, it's like a pick your... It's like a menu, it's like pick your option. As the rate goes higher, you get more grant funds. So we can actually give them an option, again, I'm making this up to make it easy for now. At 5%, you get 1% towards your closing costs and down payment. At five and a half, you get 2%. At six, you get 3%, so on and so forth. So they can actually kind of choose and we walk them through that. And that's perfect. We have clients that do have some down payment. They may have $800, you know, gift funds. They may have $1,000, they have a little bit and it's like, well, let's lower the rate a little bit, lower your grant tier, because you do have some funds, and we can actually toggle it to where they're not getting maxed out on that high rate for the full grant amount, because they do right. have some funds. So that's where our job comes in, is to see what the best program is for each of the clients. And to help give you guys the info to write up the best contract and get the deal done, right? I mean, that's the other part of our job. It's not just to get these people loans, but to make a transaction happen with you. And we can come to you and say, here's the deal, they're gonna do this program. If you can ask for this amount in closing costs, we'll give you kind of, you know, we'll help you negotiate it just between us, mm -hmm. and then we give you the ammo to go out and try to get the best deal for the client. Yeah. Sometimes you need a small concession to make this all work for the um, client, and that's a, a great thing. Um, let's see here, um, the pathway to purchase. Um, they changed a few things around this time around. They've been refunded. Um, they're letting 1.5 million out each month. Now keep in mind, this is a big caveat, it caps out each month at that, pr that point. So once the, that um, kitty, if you will, has been um, exceeded for the month, they stop reservations and you have to wait till the next month. And this just happened this month actually, a few days before the mm -hmm. end of August, it capped out and so that those other locks you had to wait until September to re-lock in those funds. So 
it can get a little hairy with that. And also you said, like, so if you have an end of the month closing, mm -hmm. for example, on the 30th, those people couldn't close on the 30th. They had to push the following month because the funds had been depleted. So right. keep closing date in mind, I would say, with some yeah. of these programs too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we need um, to talk um, definitely about the five-year repayment term. So it's a silent second, like every other DPA, everything that's recorded is a silent second. There's no repayment back, there's no rate, there's no um, payment plan on that assistance amount. With Home and Five Home Plus, they're, they're kind of married to that loan for three years. If they refinance or sell that home within three years, there's a sliding scale of how much they have to repay on that assistance they were given. On the Pathway to Purchase, if they sell or ref refinance within five years, that whole entire grant has to get paid back. And that's a big deal um, for the clients because you know if they get that full twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, you know. So we have to have that conversation. Um, um, same, you know, acquisition three seventy one <coughs> income ninety two, so those are pretty healthy. Um, same FICO six forty. If they've ever had P two P, they can't have it again. So keep in mind that's maybe one great basic question: Have you had P two P before? If they have, they cannot um, have it again. Not eligible. And then zip codes. Wait, who um, can go back down real quick? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Can't own another home. Mm -hmm. Can only be a primary residence. Probably goes without saying. Mm -hmm. Can't be used for a second home or investment property. So right? build REO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and only available in certain zip codes, which you just gave. Yeah, and then I think Liz, I um, I emailed Liz a flyer with these bullet points and these zip codes, so you kind of have an um, overview of um, where we can purchase using this program. So one thing, sorry, that you'll notice on here is most of them are kind of on the outskirts, right? But 85016 is Biltmore in Phoenix, like amazing central part of town. So, you know, keep that in mind too if you do have clients that are not wanting to live far out. Um, there are a couple in there that are a little more convenient, yeah. which is mm -hmm. great. That's a great zip code. 85301 is a great zip code. But this is you know, something that like, it's yeah, always good to try to figure out an action item like how can we give you how can we give you this info and give you guys something to do with it and actually get you some traction if you know you're talking to clients in any of these zip codes we have flyers you could use them you can format your own email send it out to them say hey just so you know about this program just makes you look like an expert you know that you know you're giving them options and maybe get them to do something yeah and sometimes clients ask outright for the dpa i want dpa and when we go over their discovery call, their income, their assets, their ability for gift funds, or, you know, we go over the whole, like a surgeon would, you know, you look at the whole entire patient, all the insides. Sometimes um, looking at an FHA loan might be a better option. Um, we give them um, all the options. If you want to look at it, let's compare a conventional, an FHA, a DPA, see what best pans out for you. So we go through a very intense process for all your clients. Um, we go through every program, every product, we don't just say, oh, we're just gonna, you know, stick you with this program. It's the best one for you, and you go with it. You know, we it's very intense. It's a friendly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On but, our end, it's intense. But she's um. <laughs> we present it not intense. And I think the one thing I want to point out that that's great that you brought that up, Christy, is to me, we're not doing our job if someone calls and says, "Hey, Stuart, I want to do twenty percent down. I want a thirty-year fix. I'm gonna buy down the rate." That's what I want to do with all this conviction. And if I don't at least show them other options. I'm not, I haven't done my job. That would be the easy button though, right? Oh, easy, perfect, boom, easy button, let's do the 20% down and we'll give you what you want. But now we're gonna take the time and say, do you want me to show you 10% down? Do you wanna see that cash recovery analysis on the monthly payment? I bet you 50% of the time that we do that from someone saying I want this, they actually go with something else. And, they, and what do they say? They go, oh man, thanks for showing me that. Yeah, I need to think about enough. that. Yeah. That's our job is to show you. Right? Could they buy down the rate on Great. Government dictates it, right? <laughs> they're giving the money and they tell you what the rate is. If they want to buy it down eight, then sure. Yeah. So, when you guys you call question. someone and they do, they say they want the P2P or whatever, and, you, and you're thinking, no, oh, it might be a better plan if you want to show that to you. Do you guys present with three options just yeah. in a presentation so they can kind of think yeah. it in? We so, they're do. not overwhelmed with everything, but they do have some. Right. Mm -hmm. We actually, that's a really good question. We, we use a discretion on how to present the information to them. There are certain people that if we send them three itemizations, it's a, it's a lot of numbers, it's a lot of line items, they have no idea what an escrow fee is, what an ultimate title insurance policy is, what's a, I mean, there's a lot that we could confuse them with, so we, it depends on the client, but we absolutely show them, it's just how we show them could be different. Mm -hmm. Got it. Does that 
that makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's just the topical you basic, yourself. you know, monthly yeah. payment, closing costs, yeah. rate, right. to kind of at least, you know, have the simplistic view of, okay, well, if I go this route, you know, um, sometimes clients um, just say, I'm an FHA loan, I hear it's the best, you know, but if they have, um, like our, I've got a client who's been searching for a home for quite some time now, and he thought FHA was the best route to go, but his score is great. He has gift from some grandpa. It just makes sense to go with a conventional loan. Um, he's gonna buy out the MI. So if there's a client who's not liking their monthly payments a little bit too high, we have MI options to present. You know, we can buy it out with a single premium. We can do a split premium. We, you know, we have so many options that we, behind the scenes, spend the diligent time preparing and we present it, like Stuart said, in a very simplistic way, just the basic numbers. You know, and some clients want to know the intricacies. How would you calculate this? How did you get to this number? Where did this come from? And we can explain that in depth if we need to, um, but most people just want the main, mm -hmm. how much on my pocket, what's my payment, what's my rate? <clears throat> we don't get off a single phone call or, end an e or any email without, do you have any more questions? Does that make sense? Like, what, what you, if you just sat in our office, that's all you'd hear us say. Mm -hmm. Because we just want to make sure they understand, because people will glaze over, right? It's a ton of information. Yeah. I mean, I was glazed over at the end of that stuff. <laughs> you said they can buy out the MI. Yeah, I was going to ask you, is, have you guys ever, and we got eight minutes, but we'll touch on this real quick. Have you guys, anyone in here know what a single MI premium is? One, two. It's awesome. So basically what it is, is mortgage insurance, typically you heard of it's paid monthly, right? Like in my example, I had a monthly MI factor. You actually have an option as a consumer to pay it monthly or to pay a single premium at closing. It's a one-time, think about like you're front-loading the MI, but you write a check for cash for it typically at closing, but... If we tell you monthly MI is $100 a month and the single premium is $3,000 a month and we do the recovery period on that and it's 2.7 years and you know you're going to be there five years, much better to pay the $3,000 up front and not have it monthly for a couple reasons too. One being whenever people take on MI, the first question they always ask typically is how do I get rid of it later, right? Mm -hmm. With the single MI premium, there is no getting rid of it. You just took care of it on day one. You paid the cash, it's, it's gone, so to speak. But if we show you that recovery analysis of three years and you end up moving before that three years, well, then technically you probably maybe should have done with the monthly MI. You would have saved more money, right? But that recovery analysis that we do on every option comparison, whether it's MI, down payments, it's really huge. It's a big eye opener for people. And so are concessions for you for that too? If you, if if you write the contract that way. Yeah. yeah. Again, yeah. great question. You can even finance it. I mean, you can get really, yeah. really uh, creative. <laughs> but we do a lot, and I, I would bet 99% of people we talk to about a single MI premium have never heard of it, meaning consumers. Is that new? No, it's been around for a long time. Yeah, that helps the DPA and everything, right? Every, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's a great point. Yeah. Some cases, yeah. we have to do that to make yeah. the deal work. Okay. Yeah. And then, I know he has a question too, but I'm going to read him no, okay, I was just going to say, also in the contract, you guys want it written that seller concessions are to include all pre-paperwork. There's a whole jargon to it, right, that just kind of covers everything? You can just generalize it. Say, yeah. like, if we tell you, hey, this guy needs $3,000, just say, we up to $3,000 in closing costs and prepaid. Closing well, title and prepaid has to covers that. everything? I thought I mean, title has to, like, be... We deal with that. Our funders, our closers deal with title when they're drafting up the settlement statement on allocating those funds accordingly, but for us on the contract, we just need be a very general just closing cost prepays. It doesn't have to list out what they're actually going to go through. Mm -hmm. That answer your question? Yeah, I guess I want to have to run into another addendum or something. Like yeah, that. no, you wouldn't. No, that's most of our contracts work that way. Cool. Yeah. Um, I know kind of the genesis of all of these programs and how they kind of branched off into different grant programs and stuff. Where are they headed? Like, you know, because in the oh, field, I've heard that they're going away and blah, blah, blah. That's a good question, actually. It's a great question. So, yeah, go ahead. So, um, pathway to purchase, they've only allocated 15 million for it, and there's a monthly cap of 1.5 million. So, if the cap's exhausted every month, it's only going to last for 10 months. So, if you think about it that way, you know, if you have people that need these kind of programs, that's a reason to maybe encourage them to buy it sooner rather than later before the funds are gone, because there's no guarantee that it'll ever come back. You know, so. That, and every program's different. Yes, They're that's just pathway to purchase. <clears throat> And there's been no indicators that the home plus can only buy. We haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything about them going away. I, increase. you know, I can remember versions of these programs 10 years ago. Right. 
Nehemiah, Meritur, you know, that's what I've been saying that, that long ago. Um, so they've kind of, I say it because they've always kind of come and gone. Um, I, I don't think these are going away anytime soon. And they, the home, home Plus Home Five has been around a while. Um, yeah, there was a $15 amount for that. For that particular yeah. one, yes. That but the one, other yes. ones, yeah. so to answer your question, we don't know the answer. We haven't heard anything. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a great question, though. They're closer to the $15 million yeah. for the pathway purchase. purchase. Yeah. But I will tell you, there's we very rarely get lead time on that stuff. I mean, it's like we get a memo and it's like, hey, it's over on Monday. We're like, oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, and we literally have to call people that are pre approved yeah. with that program to tell them it's hard. It hasn't happened in a long time. But or buy a house this weekend. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, closing yeah. seven days. Closing two, two yeah. days. Oh, it has to be closed. Yeah. It, they yeah. can't just be in. Yeah. So that's if they're in the middle of the it. transaction, yeah. no. Once that could happen to someone. Once the funds are exhausted that month, so if you, like, if you have an end of the month close of escrow, it's a big, you know, caveat. No. You just need to make sure. And <coughs> Stuart said, we don't get that earlier, indicator earlier, earlier in the until like day of, you know, if it's Friday, hey, Monday, no more funds, wait till next month. Yeah. So definitely want to avoid that end of the month closing with the future. Wow. Yeah, yeah that was a, it was a yeah. eye-opening caveat this time around. So that, was, that was worth coming to the class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember I told you if I find one thing, it's it, it's worth it? It makes it, makes it worth it. Um, but that's our job. Like, set that expectation with the client. Like, your situation you had with the guy with the rate moving, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it made me the look lender knew what they were like I didn't know what I was doing. doing. They should have said, hey, this is how it works. And just so you know, we always operate under this thing that I don't ever want to leave the office thinking that someone can ever call me and be like, dude, you didn't tell me that. Or this happened and you didn't even prep me for that. Like, we, our mindset is to make sure we tell <laughs> everything so that way we, you know, they feel good. I was irritated with my lender when we had a conversation. I put it off for a day after, just because I wanted to calm down and like make sure yeah. I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to like, sleep on it. Yeah, I don't want to be a jerk. Mm -hmm. yes. and, have a you know? Yeah. So some of these cities change in these programs, though, right? Because Maricopa used to be in there, Canton used to be in some of these, right? So that, how do they determine where they operate? That's a great question. I don't know. Uh, I don't know like because it has changed, right? Yeah. Maricopa used yeah. to be in there. Some of it has to do with like median income exactly. and things yeah. like that. Is yeah. it feel need and pounds? It's, it's like the pounds. demographic. Yeah. They want to make sure they're not redlining. Some areas. big government algorithm thing. Yeah. Nobody knows. Like, kind of like your credit score. No one knows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. I mean, USDA had we used to have changes. You know, if you guys remember that program, they still do, but the, uh, the rural program. For and Home Plus, they're statewide. So. Okay. But you can see with all the ins and outs of these, you can see how a lender could make a mistake if they're not careful. Because they can, I've seen it happen. They pre approve you for Home Plus or whatever one, and then they go, oh shoot, because I told a realtor you can only buy in the A5 roll on trips. <laughs> and they have to contact us. Oh, okay. So it's really important that we have to be on it. And she does an amazing job. So, guys, any other questions? We have an array of programs and products and ways to get them approved. Um, well, on the last slide, there's a couple links of ways to check us out. Um, our website's there, our Facebook profile, our Zillow. We're super proud because we have all five star reviews, all five star on Facebook and Zillow, which we say speaks a lot about our service. Um, Stuart is about the most humble guy on earth and would never say this about himself, but he, we're top 1% in the country, uh, top 10 lender in the state. So we'd love the opportunity to work with you guys. We are a power partner here. Um, we have been working with my home group agents for two years. Um, and really, as Stuart said, our passion is just customer service, consulting, helping. So even if we aren't the lender on the deal, we'd love to provide, you know, if you have a question or getting stuck, we're a resource for you always. Um, I'm here all the time. We have a second office on the left, and Christy's here every Wednesday. So if you ever have specific questions, mm -hmm. you know, loan questions, she's here. I'm a licensed LO, but I let them handle it because I'm better off doing other things. So we're always here if you need us. And Kelly actually did email that if it works for you, October 3rd, we'll teach our next so class. It worked fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. scary. Yeah, so my home condos fun. and anything else we want to hear about? Yeah, non traditional lending, manufactured homes. Mobile homes. Mobile homes. Uh, this was on about mobile homes, but I have a couple of clients, investors actually, looking to buy a few of those. So, okay. Anyway, and uh, 
I'm an open house person right now. I'm holding every my listings, on all my listings, I'm holding open houses. And I met a lot of people who said, I said, okay, why wouldn't you call a lender? I mean, mm -hmm. for the second time, I said, we don't call because we don't know what to ask. Oh. And then, so I they said, shouldn't okay, have to ask call, anything. Let's <laughs> call together. And so, but anyway, this is a problem. If I need visual materials, and I, yeah. I mentioned this before, I need visual materials, not just mentioning down payment assistance, P2P, um, so and so. People don't know what it is. I need something that visualizes, give them the uh, basic ter terminology when they pick up the phone and ask, yeah. do you have, I don't have, in open houses, I don't have the time to talk about loans, financing their financial situation. But so, I give them a flyer, I said, okay, it's self explanatory. Uh, these are the, the things you may ask the lender, but just call the lender, they will help you with so, this. Yeah. But I need also emailing. Many times I even don't <laughs> ask about financing. Did you talk to a lender? Uh, yes, we are pre qualified, but I don't know anything about this. I can start in emailing them, post open house uh, emails. <coughs> I need digital information and I need hard copies of a flyer. Yeah, which, I think uh, I sent them to you, but this you one sent I hear one is and I'm using it. Oh, but this is, Thank you. Very, <laughs> very, <laughs> this is more intellectual. <laughs> I need something very simple. I need something so it's more intellectual, something with pictures with happy people, <laughs> down payment zero. Okay, I mean yeah, we have payment. we have flyers for all the down payment programs and email then we those, have email those to yeah, I'll attach those, I'll attach those to everyone today. Will you? And then do that. Yeah, and, and then um, <laughs> I have a what's called a cheat sheet. It basically is a exactly. grid that tells you, you know, conventional, FHA, VA, USDA. And it breaks down what the minimum credit score is, how long that's been since bankruptcy, you know, there's any requirements like that, seller contributions. So it's very, it's laid out very easy for most people. And then if it is a person who really is uncomfortable talking about financing, because there are people out there that are like that, um, really just let them know, like, especially most lenders aren't, but our team, we are not salesy. And we tell them the whole time, we are here to be a professional resource for you. And if a client comes to us and says, you know, well, ABC Rocket Mortgage can get me this rate, that's something we couldn't touch, we're gonna to say, well, that sounds like that's a great rate for you, but be mindful of these things going through the process. Yeah. You know, so we're not, we're not, we're here simply just to provide the best experience we can for people. And I think like, make, make them know, let them know if they're uncomfortable talking about finances that it's gonna be a very comfortable conversation. And especially, I mean, this is Christy, she does the discovery calls and she's so warm and friendly and you know, if someone says, oh, I have this awful credit issue, she's gonna say, that's okay. You know, we can figure it out, let's look at it. So I think that's where most people are afraid uh, of the financial, mm -hmm. the talk. But really, as long as it's comfortable and then we warm them up, they're like, oh, this isn't bad at all. And then it easily can, you know, go through the rest of the process. So, but yeah, I can get you all these, Nadia. Also, a flyer credit optimization program or something like this, showing them that if they have, oh, I have bankruptcy recently, I don't know how recent, two years ago, I said, okay, you're ready to go. Uh, but something showing them that regardless of bankruptcy, short sale, or foreclosure, yeah. or something. You, you had something last year that, that you had sent out to the back, the back page. Yeah, we have one. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So if you have two things. Yeah. And the cheat sheet shows you the uh, seasoning requirements uh, on all those events. So thanks for remembering. Yeah. Um, always remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, awesome. I think we're a few minutes over. So if you want to go grab lunch, it's out there from Rubio's on VIP. Thanks, Jim, for picking it up for us. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. I'm just glad no one threw anything at me. No, That's but, a win. But we're all here. There's actually five VIP people here for questions. So we're here if you need us all the time. Um, and yeah, there's a Let us know how we can help you. And if you guys don't start calling us, there's going to be 15 VIP people.